most of what people care about can be thought of as a skill. Right? I mean, well-being is a, is a skill. Not suffering unnecessarily is a skill. Regulating, n noticing your emotional life and regulating negative emotion is a skill. The, the moment you begin practicing mindfulness, which is just, just learning to pay close attention to the nature of your experience, you're not adding anything to your experience, you're just noticing what it's like to be you moment to moment, but in a way that is not reactive. You're not grasping at what's pleasant or pushing what's unpleasant away. You're just, I mean, to make this concrete, I mean, let's say you have a fear of public speaking, right? So you, you, you're about to go down, uh, out on stage and you feel anxiety. The default state of someone who doesn't want to have that experience is one to, you know, in advance worry about that experience. I mean, the anxiety is kindled just by the mere thought of what you have to do. Then, once you feel the butterflies, you are at war with them, right? You, you contract, your mind contracts around it. Like, I see people do this all the time. They're, they're relaxed. I'm unhappy. You know, when am I, and you're, you're, you're talking to yourself, you're not noticing it because you're, the thoughts just come up from behind you as fast as, as, as they can, and they seem to be you, right? You're identified with each thought that emerges in consciousness. And most people live their lives as though there's no alternative. We're not given a rule book for how to operate a human mind, right? And there's no place in a normal education where, 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 uh, where it's even indicated that there's an alternative here. And so we get, we kind of stumble out into adulthood, more or less assuming that we have, we'll always have the minds we have, and that really there's, you know, we, the only thing we can do to really upgrade our firmware is to just add new content. You know, we can read books, we can, we can uh, develop uh, interests, but there's nothing at the sort of root level of our emotional and cognitive life that can change. And so mindfulness is a way of kind of dropping a little bit lower and, and realizing, so in this case, if you're feeling anxiety, there's actually a, a place from which you can just feel it, right? And, and be actually indifferent to it or anything else you could be feeling. I mean, just, just notice that there's even a, an unpleasant sensation. I mean, first you can notice that anxiety isn't even that unpleasant. I mean, it's, it's so close to excitement in its actual physiology that really the difference between excitement and anxiety is more or less just the... The, the framing. It's just the story you're telling yourself. You know, if you felt these these tingles uh, and this, you know, slightly adrenalized response right before, you know, you're about to go on a roller coaster, that's part of why you're going on the roller coaster. You like that experience, right? But the fact that you feel that way when you're about to have an interview or you're about to, you know, walk out on stage, that's intolerable, right? So just dropping back and, and realizing the, the power of the framing is, is again, this is a skill that is a fairly esoteric one, but now you know many people are, are learning it, you know, the secret's out. Um, and it, it has immense utility because then you can realize that the the half-life of negative emotions is incredibly short. I mean, one, you could you can actually be psychologically free even in their presence, right? Your 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 freedom and your well-being isn't even predicated on getting rid of the physiology, right? Like it can it can still be there. But if you're not continually thinking about all the reasons why you should be anxious, the physiology dissipates very, very quickly. And that's true for anger, it's true for anything that, that is uh, classically negative. Now, if we're talking about a clinical depression, it's, it's useful to say that there's a physiology to this that you know, can be driven from below in a way that's not narrowly responsive to their thinking, right? So it's, it'll tend to produce uh, depressive thoughts, and the depressive thoughts will tend to feed back on the state. Uh, and everything else that is good to do that people sort of lose their commitment to doing at the worst possible time should be done. I mean, you have to sort of get behind yourself and push to, to exercise and to socialize and to do things that you, know, you, you may not want to do because those are good for you and help, you know, break, can, can break you out of it. But the normal range of psychological suffering, you know, not clinical depression, but just feeling like, you know, life sucks and you're a failure and there's nothing, you know, it's like, uh, you're just, it's, you're stuck. That is a story of telling yourself a story, you're thinking, and you can either become more and more mindful of that and interrupt that more and more, 
uh, and or, and it, and it should be and, you can reframe this continually and tell yourself a better story. Right? You can actually just engineer, you know, you, you can change the code that you're, that you're you know, uh, running moment to moment. And I mean, just you know, a very simple one, which I, you know, I use, and I actually recently recorded this in a lesson on the app, you know, just gratitude, just thinking, this is actually, you know, this particular maneuver is, uh, I believe, comes from Stoic philosophy. I, I didn't actually get it from Stoic philosophy, but this, this sort of use of negative imagination where you think of all of the bad things that haven't happened to you, right? So if you're just, you know, if you're stuck in traffic, driving to the job that you don't like, and you're, you're frustrated, uh, you can think of all the things that could happen to you, right, that haven't. And if any one of them happened to you, you would consider your prayers answered if you could just be returned to this moment, right? Like you haven't been diagnosed with cancer, right? You've got two young kids, say, you know, you want to live to see them grow up, and you could be the guy who today is going to find out you've got two months to live, right? And you have to, then the next two months is spent just unwinding your worldly affairs, right? You're not that guy, right? That hasn't happened to you yet. That's just more th thinking, but it can have a profound effect. You can, you can reframe your experience in a way that doesn't actually change anything material about your circumstance, and it can let the, the light in. The generic situation we want to find ourselves in more and more is to effortlessly cooperate with creative and happy strangers, right? I mean, that we're, we, there's seven billion of us. We, ha we need institutions and laws and norms uh, and ways of thinking that take the friction out of pleasurable and non-paranoid interaction with strangers. I mean, it's not just about having, you know, five or so close friends who's got, who have your back, right? I mean, you, like, clearly we're all on the same team on some basic level. And if we can't figure out how to build a civilization where everyone thrives to some degree will have the world we currently have until it becomes unsustainable. And because I mean, we're in a situation now where I, I think it's reasonable to worry that our default state of partisanship and tribalism and rational fear of the incompatible aims of you know other groups and other people uh, is unsustainable in the presence of more and more destructive technology. I just think, I think we have to get our act together psychologically and socially in a way that we haven't yet. It may be useful to have a, a slightly delusional, self-serving bias, right? To think you're coming off better than you are. Like it may give you more enthusiasm for your life and more confidence. But anything that's too out of register is just delusion, right? And other people notice, and other people treat you like somebody who's just not tracking in a reality. Uh, and so I think we want our beliefs to be true in some basic sense. And therefore we want to be open to new evidence and better arguments perpetually, right? Because if, you're, if you close yourself off, if you say, well, listen, I'm done. I'm done thinking about reality and I know what's true. Then again, more, when more data comes in, you know, when something's surprising, when, when, when one of your intuitions proves to be faulty, if you can't error correct, again, you're just going to fall out of alignment with what's going on in the world and what with what other people think is true as well. So the, really the only mechanism we have to do that is human conversation. Right? We, we have to be open to having other people point out errors in our thinking. And, we ha in, in, and in the conversation we have with ourselves, we have to do likewise. Many of the things that people think they want out of life, the ways they're keeping score about how good their lives are or aren't, they're not seen as this experience is being delivered to them either based on the skills they have or the skills they've never thought to acquire. 